Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. My name is Jim Kalari. I'm the Editorial Director of Plastics Technology Magazine and I will be your moderator. The webinar today is titled Solutions for Extruding Low Durometer Polyethylene Tubes and is brought to you by Novatech. Our presenters are Bob Bessemer and Larry Alpert. Bob is Vice President of Extrusion Technology for Novatech and has spent more than 35 years in increasingly more responsible engineering and commercial roles, first at Killian Extruders and then at Conair. Bob has been a longtime inventor and patent holder for the plastics extrusion industry. Larry Alpert is president of his own consulting firm, MedOne Extrusion. He has nearly 40 years of experience in polymer extrusion. For 35 of those years, his focus has been on medical. Throughout his career, Larry has worked for several major medical device manufacturers in various management positions. Please feel free to ask questions at any point during the presentation. Simply detach the questions pane from the panel on the right-hand side of your screen and type in your question. We will answer as many questions as time allows following the talk. During the Q&A portion of our presentation this afternoon, Bob and Larry will be joined by Tony Walder, who is Technical Fellow of Lubrizol. I'd now like to turn the program over to Bob Bessemer and Larry Alpert. Hello, I'm Bob Bessemer. I'm Larry Alpert. And today we're going to be discussing processing low durometer urethane tubes and the test data gathered on Novatech's, Novatech's updated processing methodology. And again, you've already just heard us introduce ourselves and sorry to show our, our ugly faces, but it always helps to know who's doing the talking. So what, some of the things that we're going to be talking about and that you'll learn is why low durometer urethanes are difficult to process, how area draw ratio or ADR affects dimensional stability over time, uh, should you process polyurethane as a colder extrusion melt temperature to minimize surface tack, data gathered from running urethane through eight foot open cooling tank at three cooling water temperatures and two different ADRs, Data gathered from running urethane through eight foot multi-pass tank with three water temperatures, seven to one versus four to one ADR. Data gathered from running eight foot multi-pass tank with variations of water temperature profiling of three zones at seven to one and four to one ADRs. And why are they uh, difficult to process? Uh, well, the material itself uh, being a low durometer, it's very tacky, stretchy, rubbery, uh, as most of us probably already know. Uh, line speeds, you're usually held down because you can't, you need to be able to handle the parts that come off. Uh, difficult uh, ID and OD tolerances because the polymer itself, once it's extruded, uh, it starts to relax from the line stresses. And of course the dimensions change surface finish desired a lot of people may want to have a nice shiny glossy surface finish but of course that makes it much more tacky uh, material properties uh, if you run it cold you may not be able to obtain the elongation or burst strength that you need uh, depending on the application and again we're going to be going through in very great detail each one of these things and show a lot of pictures and video um, and talking from equipment manufacturer standpoint of view, uh, the pulling and cutting, the feeding into cutter bushings on some of these materials is, is extremely difficult and some people have felt impossible. And we're gonna be showing you some of the tricks that we've done to make that work as we go through. And one of the people that, that I've spoken to for years and years is Tony Walter. And he's, uh, he is the, the head materials person, I feel at Lubrizol, I'm sure there were others, but uh, Tony and I have gone back for years. And basically, um, as you can read here, and again, you will be able to uh, watch a copy of this at a later time, um, if you want other people to see this. Um, but he really, and this, a lot of this is directly from the, the magazine article that was done several months back, talking about this, this same subject and this multi-pass tank that we've developed. But uh, 
talking about uh, the polyurethanes have both crystalline and amorphous characteristics and proper extrusion melts the polyurethane hard segments and mixes the hard and soft segments into a homogeneous melt. And again, I'm, he talks about the tack and the shrinkage and the separation of the soft and hard segments and organize as the material cools. And this is something that he and I have talked for years and years as far as conditioning the water, the cooling slash process water. So uh, many people years ago on making medical tubing and other extrusions just ran one temperature and colder seemed like it was always better. And I've been looking at this for years and years. And we discussed can we control the heat transfer in a very controlled manner to um, modify the tack of the material? And again, we're going to go through in detail, but he was the one that first started mentioning this and really perked my interest in, can we do something to help solve this problem that everybody's had with the tack in this, especially of urethanes? And he gave us some details. I said, if we're going to run tests, Tony, what would you do? And uh, he's recommending let's duplicate, let's start a good baseline of running through just an eight foot water tank, an open water tank. And for this experiment, we did not use vacuum. We ran everything with internal air. And uh, so we were using one die. We ran the extruder at the same RPMs throughout the entire test. Larry, you might want to just briefly mention the, about the temperature. Well, the, uh, the melt temperature was not compromised to reduce the tack. Uh, we processed it at a higher, at a fairly decent uh, viscosity uh, for the extrusion. And, and again, it's, we, we didn't want to change more than one thing at a time. So we were very careful because we wanted good baseline data that was going to tell us if we're heading in the right direction to come up with a, a proper solution. So we did, as Tony was recommending, he recommended running, say, a high, a medium, a low water temperature throughout an eight-foot tank. And as you can see, you'll see we actually did run relatively cold, a 53-degree F. We ran an 85 approximate and a 110 approximate. Um, as a safety measure, we could go up to, in, in extrusion, 130 is considered the hottest. We really want to go from a, a safety uh, potential. So, But for, the, for these tests, at least for now, we went to 110. Um, obviously, and Larry and I are already talking this morning, is, you know, wow, this is just a start. We've basically had a couple of weeks of playing with this process, gathering data, and boy, we could go through and really start fine-tuning for this material, this specific material that we've run during this test and others to really optimize this process. And you'll see from the data, it, it really is leading us to some good conclusions. So we did run uh, three different temperatures. And then uh, as we'll discuss, we ran the multi-pass tank. And the first test was with the three-pass multi-pass, which is eight feet long. So basically the only thing we did was ran one temperature zone across the whole multi-pass. Uh, and all that meant was we're going to be in the tank three times longer. So, and we'll talk about why in a few more slides. And for this purpose, we only ran two different temperatures from the first findings. It kind of led us, well, at one temperature, let's find the sweet spot. So we limit for now, we just went to two different temperatures as you'll see there, and we'll show charts. And then the third section of test was running the multi-pass, so three times longer water, but now we started to modify. We have three different temperature zones, so we did start to modify whether we were warm, cold, warm, cold, hot, cold, uh, hot, cold, warm, and, and you know several variations that you can see. And again, Larry, uh, Tony was very, very helpful in guiding us uh, from the start, but we're gonna go back through some history in a few more slides. And like you said, my guess, my best guess, my guess would be to reduce tack and shrinkage is hot, cold, warm is best. And then the other profile you see is if I just wanted to reduce tack, a declining profile, hot, warm, cold, organization, organization, crystallize. Again, um, I'm hoping that Tony will be available for questions and answers. So uh, please, you know, at the end of this presentation, 
We would love to have as many questions as possible. I have asked Larry, uh, Tony, if he can be present along with myself and, and Larry. So we have as many people that can answer your questions. And, and I think anything material related, Tony will definitely be able to answer. And I wanna thank Tony and Lubrizol for supplying us for the material for this lab test. So process water temperature control uh, is an essential part of the process, just like any other temperature. Uh, why? Uh, material properties, the rate of heat transfer, the crystalline and amorphous segments, uh, how the dimensions shift over time, freezing in the set point and your drawdown, uh, where it actually uh, draws down into the water uh, and freezes off. I, best way to explain it. And again, I know everybody hates this word, but validation. And that has to do with the consistency of your process. And Larry and I go back and forth. We certainly don't want to call black art. That is when you're not controlling the variables. And one thing we've tried to do here, and I think medical extrusion people do everything they possibly can to control as many variables as possible. So uh, we're going to be controlling the hot gap, that, that distance from the hot face of the die to where the tube enters the water very precisely. And matter of fact, on the eight foot tank that we were running, we have a servo actuator so we can precisely, right to the thousands, program in the hot gap and the string up position and even the, the uh, fast retract position. So we know we teach it the die position. So that first heat transfer is in air. And then as we go into the water, that water is 100 times faster at heat transfer than air. So we have to treat it carefully. Materials will want to, you can change the material properties by the rate of heat transfer. So again, we're gonna be talking about a lot of this, but this, this is a huge variable, the water temperature within the tank. So we selected two area draw ratios uh, for this, we did a seven to one and a four to one area draw ratio. Seven to one is probably on the very outer edge of what you really want to uh, do with uh, some of these uh, polyurethanes. And, uh, and Larry, the way you got your, your ADR, the seven to one and four to one, again, you didn't change the pin of the bushing in the die. You didn't change the extruder RPMs. All you did was basically change the line speed and possibly your internal air slightly. Is that uh, correct? Actually, the internal air stayed the same. Beautiful. It, we just changed the line speed, left the hot gap uh, the same distance, uh, and the sizes were basically calculated out based on the uh, uh, the target sizes were basically calculated out here. And as you can see, the temperature profile for this uh, this material is certainly not on the cold side. We didn't actually; it wasn't really high in RPM. Uh, and of course, the the barrel pressure itself uh, wasn't wasn't extremely high. Right. And and again, one of the old tricks, and you'll be mentioning it further in the slide. If you were trying to reduce tack in a urethane like this, you might have run purposely the melt colder. Oh yes, absolutely. Much higher pressure, much more line stresses. Right. So again, we've tried to optimize this process, not try to do that not to say, and that's one of the things Larry and I talk in further tests, we could start reducing that temperature a little bit to see if we can even further reduce the tack with this process. We'll reduce the tack and still be able to control how much the diameter changes over time and when you can actually have a dependable number. Correct. And we're going to be showing you charts as far as uh, your, uh, your what I call the shrink back or uh, diameter shift. Diameter shift is the better one. There you go. Properties of uh, poly, uh, thermoplastic polyurethane products in molten state are adversely affected by moisture, as we all know. Uh, so it always needs to be dried. Uh, so this here, the, this slide talks about what was used for drying uh, and what the actual moisture content was at the time of processing as per Carl Fisher titration. Correct. And so we actually, we, we did dry it absolutely correctly. So we were actually down to uh, 200 parts per million for the, the KFT. We did use a Novatech M NDM5 compressed air dryer with a membrane. And 
and that was hopper mounted so we didn't have issues, potential issues of moisture regain. So I just wanted to let everybody, and everybody obviously should know that urethanes must be properly dried. And as far as the equipment we used, internal air in our lab, we and thank you very much for, very much for, for AirLink for Air and, and uh, online controls for providing internal pre precision air regulation units. Um, so we used them. We used the Novatech dryer. We used a US extruder, one inch medical extruder. And by the way, that was with no melt pump. So it's, it's just a straight extruder, um, which performed very well. We did have a, the screw that was correct for urethane, which Larry was quite happy yes. with. Um, we and, and did use a gill, some nice little small crosshead and the pin and bushing was listed as far as the pin and the bushing uh, sizes on the previous slide. This is just showing, uh, this is actually stringing up the multi-pass, but you're all familiar with how tacky this material and, and Larry is a, an excellent processor. Um, he's learned it's, the tricks of stringing up the line. So everybody's it, real familiar with this. This is always fun. <laughs> yes, so we're just gonna go through this slide real quickly. And this is in, in the Novatech medical water tank. This is actually the, uh, the multi-pass. Multi and again, that hot gap right there that's the string up position. You want to be relatively close. And we will move up even closer as you'll see in a yeah. further video. You could be further away if you're running a colder melt because right now the, the, the melt viscosity is not very high. Correct. So, and Larry did use irises on this, on this tank to make it easy to string up. And Larry uh, has helped Novatech design he, uh, what he calls a little tank extension, which would have helped even more. We have a one inch and a two and a half inch little tank extension with separate adjustable water level on it that Larry felt would make it even easier to see, you know, to get in there. See and get your hands in there. Correct. So again, little things, but let's move on to the actual reason for the talk. And here we're gonna show on the left, this is showing the actual line. You just saw the dryer, hopper mounted, the extruder, and you can see and the gill crosshead. The gill and there is the hot gap right there, relatively close. Water level is being precisely monitored and he didn't want the water too deep because we're free extruding. And an air wipe section. We did have a Zumbach three axis laser gauge in process and the Novatech small med puller cutter. That's a one by six inch belt and air feed cutter bushing there with our cutter, which was very helpful. We'll discuss that further. A discharge conveyor with a blow off system. And the other, you're just seeing a little bit of a close up of that hot gap. And again, you can see the iris, which everybody's familiar with. And you can see in there what it, it would have been nice to have a little tank extension that's only about uh, two and a half inches in diameter with a little uh, polycarbonate bezel so I can adjust the water, but it just lets you get your fingers in. And a lot of people, whether the rollers are there or not, these were Delrin, but if we wanted to really be worried about the tack, they could have been made out of uh, Teflon. Sure. This is something that Larry really brought up. He wanted me to put this slide in there because as we were running, and, and all these small uh, belt puller, cutter puller combos that, that Novatech makes have a servo boom. So we have an independent servo on the upper and lower boom, and you can preset the gap. And that gap can be actually made to follow the laser gauge. So if I wanted the crush differential of five thousandths, it would go right to that, follow the actual tube. But what was something that Larry really liked on this process is, and everybody's seen it, uh, on a tacky material, the tube may tend, even though the center line is perfectly in line with the cutter bushing, the tube may try to roll down. I'll get my little pointer here. Coming out, the tube may try to follow the lower belt and tend to try to sag down, or in some cases, it might tend to go up. So what Larry actually did, once he saw which direction, with the gap set, you can actually move the center line. So both the servos will operate, maintain the center and actually move the center line. In the case we did, we moved it down a little bit, maybe 10, 15,000, it's not much. Just, just enough. Just yeah. enough. And it, and it made it easier to keep feeding the material into the cutter bushing. So that was a very nice little 
feature that we kind of fell into. And as we're talking about uh, these things, the air feed bushings, if I'm running small material, putting air in here really made the difference in making it possible. And this is a, a Teflon little guide tube. Air was critical. We did try misting uh, isopropyl alcohol onto the tube as it entered here. And with this urethane, it actually made the material tackier. It destroyed, it attacked the surface. Correct. And then we went and tried just plain water, but we actually found with our system, being able to get the nip point in close and with the type of belt, um, we were able to run it dry. Yes. Uh, but with the air feed, just the right amount of air, and we did have uh, for about a 68 to 80 thousandths tube, we were running about 125 thousandths more air feed, 125 on the upstream and about 130 on the downstream. These were bolted together. Um, what was most critical on this was actually the blade speed. Uh, we started off about 1500 uh, on demand and that wouldn't work. It wasn't getting through the product yeah. fast enough. And ours do allow on our cutters, we little cutter, we can get the blades be right up to 2200. So we actually had 2000 RPM. So when that blade came around, it was passing through the material very fast, which allowed us to put a very thin 4000 thick Medex blade um, on a very high slicing angle. And many of you have heard me talking about the blade, talking about don't chop, but slice. You want to have the least amount of pressure. So when that blade is slicing, at least on a 45 degree angle, slicing down through the tube. Very critical. It's hard to see here, but we did end up using a sponge underlying belt as a two layer belt with a one millimeter thick ground silicone outer surface, which worked very nicely. Um, but again, we can experiment over time with that. And I just wanted to go through some of these things that, that we did to, just to be able to cut this material was a trick, especially as we elevated some of the temperatures. Uh, this is something Larry and I are yeah. laughing at. Yeah, most of us have been here before. Rich is showing this is typical coming off a line. And in many cases, once these materials touch each other, you can't get them apart. Uh, you're totally destroying. So an operator has typically, Larry, yeah. they're, they're standing there. Typical now is to, as a part ejects, they grab that piece right away, being very careful, and I guess they drape it over. Uh, well, it depends. Uh, some locations will hang them. Some uh, other com other companies will lay them out on tables individually. Uh, there's a lot of methods that are used that all adds time and labor. So we don't need to spend more time. We're trying to we're yeah. trying to eliminate this. So what we're showing on this slide is we wanted to be able to test the amount of force it takes to unstick these pieces. So we tried two different methods. We basically looped, just basically made a loop and just dropped the pieces onto a table so that they had a point of contact, so there was no pressure put on them at all. So that's what we call a loop. And here you can see us pulling apart the loop manually, so you can see the kind of effect. And we did actually made our own uh, in-house, uh, almost like an instrum, and we used a two pound load cell uh, to be able to measure the amount of force to pull a loop apart. And here you can see on this one, we're actually taking two and just sliding them next. We're careful not to compress them, but we're sliding them. And that, very that was strange for me, Bob, because I've spent you know close to four decades trying to keep them apart, <laughs> and all of a sudden I had to kind of put a, put them together. Right. But what we're trying to do is we wanted a repeatable method of testing different temperatures, different amount of times in the water, and then profiling multiple temperatures and find what we call a good peel testing procedure. And here is actually our homemade unit using the, the two pound load cell, which gave us very, very good data. And you can see from the screen, this is with a loop. So it's gonna be one, it, it springs, springs, and all of a sudden it will pop. See it pop? So we actually were able to record that peak where the popping occurred, how much force for each of the samples. So uh, for the loop test here, this is the uh, different water temperatures down here. Uh, this is in the eight foot cooling tank. Uh, and of course, this over here is in pounds. 
And as you could see, the lower water temperature had less force to separate, peak force, and it, it, it basically followed up with the temperature. Uh, not 100% sure if there's a time factor involved on when it comes into contact here, uh, but this is this is basically right out of the cutter. These were actually put in contact with each other. Right, and that's with your seven to one. That's seven so to one draw. You were running about fifty-five feet a minute. Yes. To get the seven to one. Mm -hmm. Now this is the four to one area draw. Same so thing. More like about thirty-five feet. This a was thirty-five feet per minute. It followed the same course. Right, and so basically now. With the four to one, we were making more like an eighty-four thousandths diameter tube. Instead well, of the, the the in process laser was 083, yep. uh, and the seven to one was 066. Okay, and so basically, we ran a little slower, so your residence time in the water is also a little bit longer. Right. With this, so it's kind of the two things are happening here. But again, you can see interesting data as we're going through. Now. What we, I want to explain also, or let Larry explain, is as we ran up to higher temperatures, the, the difficulty in feeding into the cutter, uh, in ejecting the parts in, and cutting it became dramatically more interesting. Yeah, it's, it. as, you lost, as you lose column strength, as you raise the temperature, TicoFlex is known to soft, you know, once you start getting elevating the temperature it starts to lose its column strength it becomes more supple uh and even at the 110 degree uh temperature on both of these uh sizes it really became everything in the tank became more critical it would just tack to everything and obviously we could have gone hotter but it would have, we were already having difficulty keeping the line going through the cutter even at 110 with a straight tank now we went from there to the peel test with the long. So this is where we took the tubes and let had a longitudinal of the two pieces. And, and the first one you'll see, we got separation. This is about 85 degrees. You can see the peak where it first starts to tear them apart. And then it kind of settles out. On the second part at 110, you're gonna see uh, it never, yeah, the parts get destroyed. The parts basically, we went up higher and higher with the peak force, so really tacky. And again, as Larry was saying, when we got up to 110 through an eight foot tank at whether it was 35 or 50 feet a minute, uh, if they just brushed against a roll or, or the iris touched anything, yes, it going through the laser gauge, everything air wipe, extremely difficult to process. So not not a recommended <laughs> processing temperature so uh on the on the peel test or the long data the long test uh what we did is we recorded the peak force or the moment of inertia and then i i extrapolated out the mean versus the average to ensure that they they come fairly close together uh and as you see here uh the continuous or the mean and the average didn't really change a lot. That, that that's on the the data is on the right for that. The secondary axis, while the peak is on the left. Now, Larry, when you were doing samples, also, um, especially in the when we get further on the measurement, you were doing multiple samples at multiple time increments. Yes. So basically, you were taking eleven samples in each group. Yes. And you'd take the first sample was typically right off the line. Yeah, for the dimensions, yeah. For your dimensions, which we're going to have other slides. Um, so I'm jumping the gun a little bit. So I'll wait for Just, you to get to that. So if you look at these, if you want to have some uh, background in the data behind this, there are 11 samples that we're looking at the mean and the average uh, separation force. And out of those 11 samples, there's over 25,000 readings. Yes. So again, a lot of data was compiled here. Oops. This is the uh, the four to one ADR uh, off of an eight foot water trough at different water temperatures. Uh, 
uh, as you could see here, the moment the the peak force is actually higher. There's more surface contact area, uh, but it, it follows a little bit different path, uh, and that could be because the cross section is a little thicker. I'm I'm not 100% sure yet. Maybe Tony might have some uh, ideas on that because we're seeing a drop off here uh, at this temperature on the peel force where in the past we actually saw higher right but what was interesting here we were running at this at 35 feet a minute versus yes this is a water long slide was running at 50 55 feet a minute right so where our residence time was much shorter here again we know that this is our initial data we know that a lot more testing is going to need to take place but again so this so far is it doing everything with just an eight foot cooling tank. Uh, as far as dimensional shift, uh, it, it's related to line stress recovery and is a non is nonlinear in nature. The colder the melt, the more the offset is needed. You can usually get to a point where you can predict where that end result is. Uh, maybe depending on how much work you put into it, 20, 30 minutes post extrusion you would have a good uh, number where you can predict what will happen the next day. Uh, if you have good control over your process and you have the right key variables. And again, the reason why we wanted to talk about dimensional shift, because the next few slides are going to go talking about uh, where we actually took measurements under the different conditions as far as the OD took measurements at different time intervals, including 24 hours later. Uh, to see how much the diameter actually changed per the process. And measuring it right out of the puller, uh, which we did do, I did do a measurement right out of the puller, but there's a lot of variability in that because the the difference between 15 seconds out of the puller and 25 seconds out of the puller uh, can be a lot. It it really changes drastically. Right. In, and within that, the and that's where we're talking about when you're pulling the material from the hot die, through a tank, whether it's a three foot tank, a 10 foot tank or whatever length, that product is under tension. You are drawing it down. So it's like a long rubber band. And so being that the material has no time to relax until it exits the puller, it's relaxing, shrinking back continuously for a period of time, up to 24 hours, because it's been under tension. It's 24 hours is the usual accepted practice as being able to generate final data mm -hmm. uh, on your extrusions. So with that, we're just showing the what we did here as far as an offline measurement system. Again, thank you, Zumbach, for lending us an offline laser measurement system. Again, we wanted good data. And so this is what Larry was using to actually measure the parts at different intervals coming off the line to actually see how the diameter changed under different conditions which we're gonna be presenting the data. So if you see here, uh, the high, this is a high draw ratio at, at various temperatures in just a uh, eight foot cooling tank. And if you look at it, the, uh, the 110 degree water temperature really extended out the dimensional shift. And if you look at the time increments, there's the in process, you have basically the zero minute mark, which is basically right out of the puller, trying to be as consistent as possible as how long it actually takes to get the measurement. Then at five minutes out of the puller, 10 minutes out of the puller, 20 minutes out of the puller, and then 24 hours later. Right, you can see the bottom of the chart. So the, the blue is the 53 degree process temperature and the orange is, is 85. And then the, uh, the grayish is the 110. So this is showing you that, that that shrink back. And again, we're going to show various different conditions here. Under these conditions, it looks, you know, it appears with a 85 degree water right now out of these three appears to be the best for this. But there is still, you know, shift from the 20 minute to the 24 hour mark. And, and again, this is showing approximately 7 to 1 ADR, which was running at about 50, 55 feet a minute. Then you shifted to the four to one, which we dropped the line speed down to approximately 35 feet a minute. Right. And again, you can see the same chart, how things changed. 
Absolutely. It's a thicker cross section as well. Uh, and the dimensional st shift still happened. Uh, and as you can see, it's definitely nonlinear. And from there, we're going to start blending in, going back a quick history. Um, uh, many years ago, when I say many years, it's probably in the 10 to 15 years ago time frame, I had met these two gentlemen, Brolio Polanco and Stephen Majol, um, both Lowell graduates, both very smart gentlemen. And uh, they knew, I used to visit them at this particular company, we're not mentioning names, and um, they knew I'd worked on a multi-pass tank of my previous employer. And um, at that point, I had an 18-footer and I had a 24-footer. And they were saying, wow, I'd love to see you build a short one because we, we do a lot of urethanes. And we found that if the urethane remains in the water, process water longer, it seems to give us a little bit more time uh, to, that we can have the material possibly touch that we can get to the part and take it to the next side, part of the process. And um, it intrigued me, but at that point, um, there wasn't enough interest I didn't feel, or the, you know, my company didn't feel, that we could make a much shorter tank because we were using them for high-speed processing and it was a very specialized market, urethane, especially small catheter pick line type market. Um, so they had mentioned that, and they also had mentioned that not only, you know, be in the water longer, we didn't get into temperatures that much at that point, um, but I'm sure they had done experimenting with that. But they also said, you know, if you can get it onto a perpendicular conveyor and keep the pieces from touching each other and run it under a little bit of an oven for an hour, 165, 170 degrees, that you could all but cure the material right online and come right off of that side conveyor and start packaging it. So this was intriguing, and this goes back a lot of years. So I just, this is kind of introduction to where we're heading next. And so what they were talking about is, and we're showing a picture of a three pass tank and a polar cutter, a regular conveyor, ejecting the parts onto a perpendicular conveyor with an oven on it. So is this possible? And this is why we're doing, we gotta do this testing in stages. If a multi-pass tank, with multiple stage water and being in the water longer for the tube helps, maybe we can get it off the first conveyor with less tack and actually get them to a point where we can get them onto a perpendicular conveyor and cure them right in line and eliminate all this process of hanging pieces overnight. And, and mm -hmm. the next one, we basically, you know, and Larry is going to give mm -hmm. some history because uh, Larry also, you know, I was talking about Steve Majol and, and Ambrolio in talking what they were pushing before, but Larry also can share some experience that goes back a lot of years on things that he's seen. So trying to combat tackiness of TPUs is part of the reason why polyurethane processing is seen as a black art, which it's not. In order to reduce the tacky nature of the surface, processors will often try to run these materials as cold as possible in order to change the surface morphology enough to reduce the tack. But doing this increases variability by changing the stresses of the extrusion line, which in turn will change the stress relaxation of the part and thus the dimensions. Since the dimensional shift is nonlinear on a time scale, without any form of controls in place, it turns what can be a predictable nonlinear function into an unpredictable chaos. I love that term. <laughs> as well, the habit is not always desirable for product performance as there are noticeable losses in physical properties such as tensile elongation or chemical resistance. Uh, as an example, this happened, uh, this was probably late 1980s. Uh, I had a polyurethane coating extrusion for making the uh, high pressure braided tube uh, out of Pelothane 236380A. It needed to have good optical clarity. So of course, going cold in temperature was not an option. When you say cold in temperature, material. Cold. Material, material cold in temperature. Yeah. Yes, we could not, uh, it had to be, had to have good optical clarity. Uh, and this is in two, uh, two separate extrusion processes because it was braided. So the, the, the first thing we tried was adding a second water trough to the line, doubling the length of the cooling. The effect of that was subjectively better, but still not good enough as once the PUR, PUR exited the trough, the tack would return after a short while. 
that's when it was decided that we needed to increase cooling time and maximize as much as possible the crystallinity of the urethane. Luckily, we had a two-zone trough. It wasn't meant to be a dual uh, temperature system, but we made it that way. Uh, and I, I then had attempted a discrete hot to cold water system. This appeared to be the right track uh, to take uh, as the problem was negated 95, 90 to 95%. Though we still needed an ironclad solution to manage over 20 million feet of extrusion and 10 million feet of final product over the course of a year. Uh, it was decided to increase the, the cooling uh, rate or actually decrease the cooling rate further. And the next step is I created a virtual zone tank, three zone tank, by changing the flow properties, uh, entering hot water in the front and actually allowing it to flow to the back uh, and creating a zone where it went from about 110 degrees and then uh, slowly changed over a few feet down to 65 degrees. Yeah, and, and the big thing is that we don't know, Larry. And, and again, this is going back 30 years or more. Yes. And you know, so this isn't something new. This has been something that, that people such as Larry, other processors in, in, the, in the world have had to try and find different things to work. And we're wanting to do this scientifically. One thing that's difficult though, is determining what is the particular material, particular line speed, how long should the chambers be, how long should the overall tank be for the residence time? And so there's a lot of experimentation that's going to continue to happen here. This is what the line that we use. So we still have the same internal air unit, same extruder, same dryer, same crosshead. In this case, we have an eight foot multi-pass tank. So it's got three passes. So we're basically, instead of eight feet in the water, we're approximately 24 feet in the water. Still have the hot gap. So we go down through and for this test, we'll talk about further, we did everything open, free extrusion, so no vacuum. Went around the master wheel, which is servo polar number one, and go down through pass number two, go to servo driven polar number two. And we'll talk more about this and then make the third pass coming out. And we'll go through an air wipe section, there's our remote control. Go through an air wipe section and come on through the Zumblock laser gauge and you can see we had very low flexure. We'll talk about that more. So there's very low tension, same puller cutter, same cutter bushings and same conveyor ejecting the part off. Looks like we could have sped up the conveyor a little bit. Really. Ejecting the parts. Just to talk quickly about this is, again, we went through and for this test, this first chamber, which is three feet long, was zone number one. The second section, which is also open atmosphere, was zone number two. And then the open section was zone number three, where polar number one, polar number two, and then your external polar was number three. So we have three loops. The reason for having this is so this is my main puller. So there is tension on the product pulling from the hot face of the die. So this first pass, the tube is under tension. And when we went from 35 to 55, talking the ADRs, that's where that was affected. Our goal, and we've exaggerated in this picture, we, and Larry will talk about this further, we slowed puller two down in reference to puller one. And there will be a slide talking about speed, the differential between puller one, puller two, until we saw the material float up. We did the same thing by slowing down polar three in reference to polar two until we saw the material float up. Because what we're trying to do from this point to this point is let the material relax in line. And we're gonna talk about playing around. So our first test that we're gonna be talking about is where we had the same water temperature throughout all three zones. And then we will talk about profiling temperature one, two, and three. Um, Talking about the length of this tank, I talked and discussed for long and hard with Larry Walter as far as, okay, if I build one of these tanks, how long should the tank be for the majority of the small products where people are having difficulties if we're gonna provide a good solution? 
And we started off talking six foot, then eight foot, then 10 foot, then 12 foot. But as a medium, we decided we ended up at, at an eight foot. So we have three, three, and then the open section. This is something that over time, we may find that we need to make one chamber longer, one table chamber shorter, and or whatever, what the mix and match. But this was a good place to start. Just showing this is what the touchscreen, so this is a lot going on. You can adjust uh, three pullers from this tank. You can adjust three different temperature zones. So it's it, within this tank. And if you had a vacuum system, you can adjust the vacuum system. So an awful lot going on. Uh, it has to be really, made simple. It's not as complicated as it looks. And by the it, way, here uh, in this the picture, interface worked pretty well. you can see the material floating up. You can see how it exits the water. We actually would slow down Polar 2 until we saw the material actually start to break the surface. We uh, Actually, we brought it to failure and then kind of trimmed it back. We, and, let, it fall, we let it come off. We so, let it fail. So basically, mode of failure with this is if you slowed down Polar too much, the material would fall off the wheel. That yes. was his his mode of failure at this point. And with that, we're going to let Larry go through some of the data. Okay. With this style. So we did the uh, the peel test data on the multi tack uh, on the multi pass tank. Uh, if you look at the at the first uh, data set over here, uh, this is just a single water temperature, and then of course the water temperatures are shown below. And, you know, based on what we were seeing, we were making some changes. So the, in the water, the peak force uh, was actually very high at 85 degrees, uh, all one temperature. And as we started changing uh, how, how this was going together, we were able to reduce uh, both the peak force and in in essence, the uh, overall average or mean force. Right, and, and Larry, we really only ran one steady temperature and we did one temperature alone with this. We basically found the sweet spot was 85 degrees. So we all we wanted to do was run the best that we'd done on the eight foot tank and just right, make just to it compare. longer. So just have 24 feet of water rather than eight at the 85 degrees. So we, that was, starting off at a good spot we didn't feel was necessary to run cold the whole way through or hotter than 85. Right. So that's why you don't see more uh, single temperature in the multipass. We right away started doing profile work and you can better explain uh, what we were doing and uh, as we progress through here. Well uh, you know uh, the part of it is you know the back section uh, is where you're stress relieving the product. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do is get some varied temperatures in there. Uh, also, too, we've seen in some of the other uh, some of the other uh, water temperatures that cold water actually helped reduce the tack. So we were playing as well as dimensional stability uh, numbers with the various area draws. Very good. And you can see the results. And again, we'd be glad to discuss this later. And, and we will be opening up the lab for people that want to bring in their own material and basically kick the tire a little bit. And we're going to continue to experiment. We, we could only do so many variations to start yes. leading us in the right direction. But we did feel this is valuable information to share. Now, this is a, a, an example of a couple of the tests, te uh, tests that we did just in stress relieving where we're showing the uh, percent of the overall diameter change. Uh, this is just OD versus the speed delta that we had between the very first pull and the third pull. So, uh, so basically, this is we're showing the this where we changed it from 55 feet a minute to 35 feet a minute. Right, and then you'll see the speed deltas were actually uh, the lower speed and the lower draw. We were able to get the, the speed delta uh, a little higher percentage. Yep. Uh, now the multi-pass tank, uh, just on the single temperatures uh, here, showed a little bit different profile. Uh, it shows here that uh, it looks like the uh, you can actually have at about 20 minutes 
after the extrusion at 20 minutes, you have a reliable number that should be pretty darn close to what your final dimensions will be, which is a, a pretty good. Right. It's interesting is when we first started these experiments, the focus was to reduce tech. And it, that, that was my major thing. I didn't realize the, the difference in dimensional changes and the predictability um, and Larry started getting quite excited about this this fact because he said, you know, it's a guessing game um, with a normal well, it's tank. it's this here, right? If you look at the, whoop, go back. If you look at this, from here to here, and then you go back to the other charts on the single tank and look at the what what the deltas are from five minutes offline to 24 hours offline. Right you'll see a drastic difference. Right, so it's what we're finding is not only were we manipulating the tack, but we were also making the, the end product, the dimensional stability far more predictable. Uh, you, you find out, I've talked to some people that when they're running, they might run three different sizes in the day, hang them on the racks the next day, come back and only one of those is actually going to be in spec. So they're running a lot of a lot of wasted time productivity being lost. So Larry was, as we were going through, was was for Larry to get, show excitement is, is interesting. I have <laughs> not seen it very often, but um, to be able to say after five or ten minutes, he knew what the end product was going to be. It was it was pretty interesting and and something we've kind of fallen into. So it was very nice to see the predictability. Uh, here is where we actually started changing temperatures as we were measuring the uh, on a four to one ADR. So as back we're, about 35 feet a minute again. Right. As we were measuring uh, the uh, the tensile on separation, we were also measuring diameter and looking at uh, at the change. And once again, in this area here, this is kind of I, I guess we're getting accustomed to hearing flatten the curve. Uh, and that's kind of what was done here. Uh, and it looks like this combination may have been best. Uh, there's not a lot of drift between the 20 minute mark and the 24 hour mark. So that was the running slower, 35 feet a minute. So the four to one, and that was approximately a 95 degree up front, followed by a, a, a 50 degree, pretty cold, followed by a warm 85. So far from a one temperature zone. Right. And if you look at this, the final dimension here isn't even two thousands larger than the starting dimension. So that's a very small percentage. Correct. But the nice thing is with after five minutes, it was as close to flat as you can probably get, which was great news. Right. So with that, as far as conclusions. So, of course, uh, as many of us already know, lower drawdown. Uh, or area draw ratio decreases dimensional shift. And is gonna give you better burst strength. And gives you better burst strength. Uh, longer duration time in process, water decreases surface tack. Three pass tank with three independent pullers allows inline predictable dimensional shift in shorter time frame. Three independent water temperature zones combined with multi-pass benefits allows for minimized tack and more predictable dimensional shift. A dramatic decrease in processing labor and increased production. And wanted to thank uh, all the people, I call them our partners, that, that helped us to make this possible. Thank you, US Extruders and Airlink Systems and Online Controls and Advantage for their chiller and Zumbach Electronics, extremely helpful, and Gill Tool for the die and die help. Luberzol, very much so, Tony and his team, and also giving us a nice amount of material to, to test and acyclean uh, to help us clean things up afterwards. And, and thank you all. And again, the next step is we, we had to first prove that this is working. We're going to spend a lot more time. And again, we're going to be opening up our lab for people to come in and use this tank, bring their material, bring their dye, and basically try different temperatures. We will. We're going to be running it every week. But if we can then work on getting the part to come down the, the uh, in less tack and we can predict the dimensional shift, um, we can if we can kick it to a perpendicular conveyor and have it go under an oven conveyor for an hour, 
possibility of having the part come off fully cured is real. So this is our next area of work here, other than doing further testing with this tank. Yeah, we could you definitely do some uh, further testing. I believe that's warranted as far as oh, yeah. being able to but, reduce tack even further. Right, and again, we wanted to share where we are now, and obviously we're gonna continue. We feel we're definitely on the right track. And again, I uh, wanna also thank uh, Steve Gilmeister and Matt Richards and Jeremy Bears in our lab for helping us make this possible, along with Larry and myself. And, and thank you, Larry, for, for for helping because we're running a well, difficult material, your experience. Well, thanks, Bob. It, it's actually been enlightening working with some of the uh, new technology. And thank you very and much. Thank you look forward to your questions. Your questions. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for that presentation. Uh, am I coming through clear enough here? Uh, yes. We do have a couple of questions. Um, Bob, since you since you mentioned near the end about the oven conveyor, uh, can you give some kind of a timetable on when you will begin working on that? I would say based on where we are right now, we're going to be working on that and should have a product before the end of the year. But obviously, we needed to get past this first level to make sure we're on the right track, which I feel we definitely are based on the data. So we'll be, it's, it's making an oven conveyor is a pretty simple process. Actually, the most difficult part is going to be ejecting the part off the normal conveyor in a manner that uh, the pieces aren't crossing over each other. So we have to eject them properly so they are sitting side by side as they roll down the perpendicular conveyor going through. And we need about an hour of time under that 165, 173 right. temperature. So right. it's a good bit of work. Um, we should have everything rolling, but again, a lot of development time is gonna happen. Right. Could you uh, could you be specific as the as to the type of belt, the uh, puller belt material that you would recommend for this application? Well, we had several different belts, and in creating the new uh, belt pullers for medical extrusion for Novatech, um, all our belts are flat belt underlying material. They're not uh, they're not uh, grooved in any way. They're flat belts, so they're very flexible, so we can get very good gapping consistency. Um, I, we started off, we did use about a 60 durometer nitrile, which was white FDA material, but because of the work we're going to be doing with taper tubing, I also had a two layer belt developed, which was a black sponge, closed face sponge belt underlying, which is about five millimeters thick with about a one millimeter, uh, ground, uh, clear silicone and the clear silicone is FDA. So we've, and it, uh, the ground is FDA in the silicone. So it made a very nice belt for gripping parts with barely any touching to it. And yet, because of silicone, the material wasn't sticking or trying to wrap around it. Although when we got up to 110 degrees, we actually did have a little bit of wrap around issue. Right. It's right. very tough, but that belt seems to be doing a good job for us. Thank you. Uh, when do you expect the multi-pass tank to be available uh, for, uh, for sale? Um, we're actually entertaining within the next month, starting to sell them. We are going through, we've just gone through what I call a product evaluation meeting this past week and formalized based off of the running uh, with everybody involved, including Larry, as far as some final changes to the unit. Uh, one thing that we, we know we're changing that particular multi-pass was a three pass only. The final design now will allow you to have a single pass for running larger tubes, which may not, which may have a diameter too large to go around the wheels. So to be able to use single pass, you can move, move the air wipe from the three pass position over the single pass or use it as a three pass. And the rest of a few little cosmetic and, and tweaks and tunes. Uh, so that unit, we're, we're going to be starting to order them in components two or three at a time. So again, we would look to be starting to ship on or before the end of the year. Okay. Um, on the uh, on the eight foot tank uh, that you, you you discussed what you were uh, doing in the lab. What could you comment as to the speed on a foot per minute basis 
uh, that the line was running and what the wall thickness was of the tube? Larry, I'm going to let you go for that one. Well, the uh, seven to one area draw ran at 55 feet per minute and the four to one ran at 35 feet per minute. The seven to one area draw was approximately a seven mil wall while the uh, four to one was approximately a nine mil wall. Okay. Um, the uh, processing uh, um, tips that you discussed uh, during your presentation, are they applicable for higher durometer compounds as well? Do they have similar issues during processing? Well, the, the higher durometers, uh, they don't change dimensions as much uh, because the line stresses, uh, they don't have as many line stresses, uh, but they do get tacky. Uh, I, I've had quite a few uh, applications in the past with 55-65 D-urethane where it had to get basically thrown off of one conveyor onto another uh, to be able to get some accumulation time before you could actually put them together. Mm -hmm. What is it about thinner walled products that don't seem to lend themselves to cutting online? <laughs> I'll answer that one. <laughs> So uh, the thin wall, and, and I mentioned it within the within our slides, um, that you you absolutely have to slice them. But the thin of the wall, and I know people are processing wall thicknesses on or down below one thousandths now. So it's it's and we're talking about trying to cut a product that's like a a rubber band. And if you don't slice the part with a very thin straight blade, the blade is first going to compress the part flattening it prior to penetrating it and cutting through and causing a lot of uh, uh, force in the cutting. So, and, but even with, and I've shown that by having people hold a piece of the tube between their hands and taking the same blade, pushing it straight down versus having that same blade on a 45 degree angle and a little of the slicing motion causes a lot less force to cut through. But the thin wall, there's just not a lot of uh, strength to it. And even with a very thin blade slicing, and by the way, we were going through a, a lubrication bath, so we were wetting the blade uh, to help it. Um, but the material, as the blade's cutting through, it tries to stick through it. So the biggest trick is cutting on a very high slice angle, very high blade speed. This is the highest blade speed I've ever had to work with that we've, I was, our electronics people were able to do for us. Mm -hmm. um, but even, it, it's very difficult. Not every material is going to be able to cut online, but uh, we're certainly going to try. It, it, but it's it's not. It, it is a great challenge. Right? Yeah. So, so I just like to add that sometimes, even if you could cut it online, you might not even be able to handle it afterwards. Yeah. Right. And, and part of the trick is the material is so tacky. Just the force of the blade going through it will stick the two ends together. Um, mm -hmm. We were able with the blade slicing the way we did in the air feed bushing. We actually were able to slice through it, even with 100, when it was very hot coming out of the eight foot straight tank, 110 degrees, uh, we weren't closing off the ends. It was still right. a two, but just picking it off the conveyor, touching it with your fingers, in many cases, you, you'd flatten it and you couldn't get it apart. Right. Uh, do you see a lot of water movement in uh, running into hotter water um, at walls of 0 0.002 inch or thinner? Larry, a lot, a lot of, of a lot of wall movement. A lot of wall movement. Right. No, not really. Okay. All right. When, when you're saying wall movement, are you saying the con concentricity fluctuation during the processing? Yeah, maybe a little clarification on that. Uh, whoever asked that question could clarify. We're are running a little bit out of time, but I want to run through these. Have you done any testing to determine the dimensional limits of the multipass? O D I D. No, uh, what we tried to do was pick a very common uh, close. And the, the original size of O sixty six was similar to a pick tube, so it's a very common size that a lot of people are running. So this is just the start. Um, we obviously can run smaller. We obviously can run bigger. With the multi pass, we are running around a ten inch wheel and eight inch wheel, so there is a limit to how large the diameter can be without affecting the tube by going around, you know, bending it around the radius. So for now, I would say that tank probably wouldn't want to run much over a, a quarter inch, maybe 300,000 OD. Yeah, but, that, 
I would see that being dependent on material wall thickness. Uh, you know, what we did, uh, basically everything was under one thousandths as far as min to max. Mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't really affect it. Uh, when it starts affecting your roundness, uh, it'll, it, it'll tell you there's a problem. Okay. And uh, gentlemen, are you going to make this presentation available if somebody wants a PDF? How do you want that to be handled? Um, I would say if they want a PDF, there's not an issue. Um, the as far as the the unit with with video, uh, we could probably make it available on YouTube. We just can't allow it to be copied. Yeah, I think someone would like the. Uh... Now here's a clarification on the. Um the wall movement. When I say wall movement, I mean the actual polymer being more soupy and thus creating dimensional instability versus the colder water, more polymer movement related to water temperature. Well, I haven't seen that in the past. I, I mean, I've used various water temperatures over the years for different polyurethanes. Uh, everybody has in trying to uh, uh, attempt it. Uh, attempt to get rid of a, some, as much of the tackiness as possible. Now, I haven't seen anything uh, attributed to that. Uh, I, I've seen dimensional instabilities uh, with, the, with the water temperature is too high. Uh, if, that's, if that's really what the, you know, the point of the question is, right. uh, is you can, you know, when you start getting to 120, 130 degrees, uh, or higher, sometimes you're gonna, you can have some really uh, difficult time uh, in achieving any kind of stability. Right. And with, Jim, what probably be good is that if anybody has deeper questions, they're obviously welcome to contact Larry directly or myself or Tony right. Walter directly with specific questions. And, right. Uh, one. Okay. We still have quite a few attendees online, so I would like to run through these a couple of these questions here. Uh, in terms of the lubricant for the blade, Bob, what do you recommend? Isopropyl, water, silicone, silicone? Well, in a lot of cases, the urethanes, uh, people are not allowed to use isopropyl alcohol because it will affect the surface. Um, so distilled water is probably the most typical and it is allowed. Um, so I would say distilled water, some lubrication is better than none for, for keeping the blade wet. Mm -hmm. uh, alcohol actually was causing us a problem when, we were, when the material was hotter coming through the cutter bushing. So we, right. we actually stopped using the alcohol, but we did have water uh, wetting the blade. We had a, right. a lubrication tray, so every time the blade made a pass, it went, it went through picking up a little bit of liquid. Right. Uh, with packaging being an issue, as Larry stated, do you envision working on developing an automate an automated co collecting machine? Novatech itself won't do that, but we will most likely be working with automation companies, uh, as some of the companies will request, and uh, we'll have to interface with them. And right. there are many companies building very specialized packaging equipment, and that's always an option. Okay. Um, as the wall thins out, do you anticipate a significant drop in dimensional shift and tackiness versus a thick wall part under the same conditions? Um, I would think you might see more of a shift, not in actual measurement oh. values, but in percentage. Right. Uh, because there's so much more stretch, you're going to have so much more line stresses. Okay. Um, do you think smaller diameter and thinner walled samples would stabilize quicker? Well, that's one of the that's one of the uh, tests that we're, we're we've been talking about is going to smaller diameters uh, and doing some uh, dimensional measurements on them and finding out how much we can get them to stress relieve in line. Yep. Yeah, because it, it was it was the one video was really showed it. Um, coming out of the out of the air wipe, going into the puller, you could put your finger under there, and that material was extremely relaxed. Um, you wouldn't dare do that coming right out of just a straight eight foot tank because the material is under tension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was very okay. vision. What would happen if we had Tecoflex or Tecothane low durometer but no barium sulfate? 
Well, I would think that whatever, I mean, your therm, your rate of thermal transfer is, is going to be a little different, but, you know, I would think that the, what is discovered uh, should be valid. You may have to, uh, you know, approach it, uh, your particular product with maybe a, a DOE with some of the key variables to find out what best suits, mm -hmm. uh, what best suits your own specific uh, product. Right. Yeah. And I would assume without the barium, it might be even tackier, Larry? Yeah, probably. Hi, this is Tony. The tack is about the same between the barium and the non-barium. I would say for the video, uh, it's a lot nicer having barium sulfate with a blue color than a clear, which you would never probably see as it's running. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, it would be pretty close to the same. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Tony. Um, last question, why use DDR versus ADR? Well, I normally, I, I normally look at both of those, uh, but ADR is the important factor. Uh -huh. um, but it's just a comparison, comparison numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's automatic now with, you know, spreadsheets today, you can just automatically calculate anything, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like to see all the numbers. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. Would using a longer bath, i.e. greater than 8 feet, maybe 24 feet, would that have a greater effect on dimensional stability? I'll answer this one, and then Larry might add in, but uh, there's always been the factor of what we call the rubber band effect. And that's where Tony and I talked about the different lengths. And the longer the distance from the hot face of the die to the first capstan or wheel, we'll call it, the first puller. The longer the distance, the more rubber band effect there is and probably more fluctuation. So that's why Novatech actually builds a, a tank as short as three feet long uh, for some of the products, including taper tube of some of the real loaderometer materials. So I would say for coming out of a three quarter or one inch extruder, the eight foot is probably a perfect size. You know. I'm not saying we couldn't do a six footer at some time, but it seemed like we weren't getting a lot of what I call the rubber band effect. We did not have an ODID wall system hooked up at this time because we were trying to keep this test pretty simple, but uh, we could definitely, once we have a full ODID wall and look at automatic control, con you know, controlling ODID and wall, controlling vacuum or internal air and or the puller, we would definitely see that. But uh, I definitely on this material wouldn't go any longer than eight, maybe 10 feet without seeing some, some of this, what I call a rubber band, where you'd see the diameter uh, and the wall thickness going up and down over a period of time as it, as it, uh, as, as well, it's yeah, I, I could see that it's dependent on the size of the product. I mean, the smaller tubing, you still have the weight of the water uh, to, con uh, to contend with. Uh, and, and the friction from the water, while it's not high, it still adds. I mean, there's a lot of times where you see small polyurethane uh, tubes that are made in a tank that is probably longer than what is wanted for it, and it may be under the water the first few inches in the tank, and then after that, it floats on top. It's not even submerged anymore, because when you go to submerge it, it just creates all kinds of havoc trying to keep it under the water. Right. All right, you're not off the hook yet. Um, <laughs> dimensional, dimensional stability comes with tank distance. Was that controlled? For Techoplex, the further the distance, the less shrinkage and more stability. Yeah, we left the, uh, we left the extrusion uh, parameters as well as the tank position uh, as a constant. Okay. All right. Um, that wraps it up. Um, I'd like to thank Bob and Larry for their informative talk. And Andrew. for their for their involvement, as well as uh, Tony Walder from Lubrizol, with this uh, very interactive Q and A session, I'd like to make all attendees aware of the fact that the webinar was recorded, and everyone who registered for this webinar will shortly receive a link to the recorded version, which will be on the Plastics Technology website, ptonline.com. So please feel free to tune in again or forward the link to any of your colleagues who could not join us today. Thank you, gentlemen. Goodbye. So long, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.